Just a little music there, Larry. You know what, really, when I first saw this guitar, this is 30 years ago or more. Yeah. Because I saw this right here. Yeah. That's that that's screw. Mm -hmm. Countersunk. That's an early, or an earlier Bigsby. Yeah, it is. And that's like the uh, Chet's, Gretsch, the Dark Eyes. Yeah. The black 6120 that people call Dark Eyes. That's right. I remember seeing that. I've uh, got his a... Dark Eyes guitar had a had a Bigsby of this vintage. Yeah. And that would have been 56. Yeah. When his was made. Right. And this is a 58. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tell a story about uh, when you met Chet Atkins, and he was 17 or 18 years old. Yeah, um, yeah, he came to fishery school out here, and uh, he was traveling with uh, Bill Carlisle, Archie Campbell, and uh, the Carlisles, and he's playing fiddle for him. And uh, Bill played a part called Hot Shot Elmer. And during the time that he was putting on his costume, Chet came out and played the, a couple tunes on the guitar. And I can't remember for sure, but I believe that uh, the, one of the tunes he played was Maggie. Mm -hmm. And I uh, don't recall what the other, well, then Hot Shot came on the, he got dressed in his costume and come out and Chet come down and sat down in the in the audience with us and uh, Red Peterson or lives here or lived here in Irwin he was sitting on the bench there and uh, they were about the same age I think it's uh, Red said there's about four days difference in their age but he, he came down and sat up there and uh, right over from me and uh, kind of hardly remember but it, it seemed like it was in 42 or 43 I'm not for sure right now and uh, the Chet was 18 about 18 years old so uh, uh, it was a pretty interesting show and he played real good then yeah I thought Ron Hensley's dad was a principal at the school and he was the one that got the Carlisles and Archie Campbell and Chet to come to the school I played. Hmm. And uh, he was always bringing in uh, entertainment uh, you know for a little extra money for the school. 
had uh, Bill Monroe, and that was back when Lester and Earl was with him, and he, he brought uh, uh, the Stanley brothers, Jim and Jesse, and he had Mac Wiseman there one time, and always when they had music like that, I always managed some way or another to go, and uh, it didn't, didn't cost much. So uh, I go see him. And, uh, Larry and Red played together for a long time. He'd go over and sit with me. And I used to go out and sit and play with Red a whole lot. And, uh, about all the old boys are gone now. You know, I'm 88. Is that right? Yeah. Then Red, did he play? Uh, he backed up Cowboy Copus for for yeah. a time, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. And that's uh, what I was thinking. He played in in Michigan. Uh, Red stayed up there for seventeen or eighteen years, and all the big stars had come through, you know. And he played backup for him. So Detroit. Yeah. Detroit. Detroit. Yeah. And uh, so. Uh, Baltimore. He was in Baltimore yeah, in the early fifties. He stayed 50s. in Baltimore for a year or two. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> he he left that kind of uh, life just in order to save his life. You know, he said that you couldn't play in those bars, the clubs, stuff like that, unless you drank. You know. Everybody else did, so uh, Red just gave it up and come home. And uh, he worked here around, worked for the city, and finally retired. And uh, the night he died, uh, he went over to Elizabeth to play, and he, he called me and wanted me to go over with him, and I had something else to go do, and I don't know what it was now, but. Anyway, he went over and uh, his brother Jim went with him. And Jim was telling me that he played the best that he'd ever heard him play. And he come home that night and left his amplifier in the car, got his guitar out, went in the house and started walking down the hall. Heart attack died. I don't remember what year that was. Some time back. Do you remember? Yeah, I think it might have been around 2003, 2004. Yeah, somewhere around in there, yeah. So I remember Ray Hughes stopping by the house. Yeah. JR, remember him? Yeah. And telling me he was going over there that day. Yeah. You know, to their, out on Willow Street. Their home place. I remember Ray pretty well. He, yeah. I think it was 2003 or four. Yeah. And uh, he, uh, Red was a good friend of mine. Uh, mm. Liked him. But uh, uh, Ron Hensley and me was, we, we lived in Baltimore to get work. Anyway, uh, he come by one day and said, Chet's going to be in Washington, and uh, Washington, D.C., and he said, uh, let's go over there. I said, okay. So we went over there, and, and uh, during the intermission, uh, Chet went backstage, and Ron said, punch me, and he said, let's a sneaker way back there. And I said, okay. So we went back, and Chet was sitting back there smoking a cigar, and uh, some woman was traveling with him. I, I don't even remember her name, but uh, Ron just went up and introduced himself to Chet, and uh, so uh, uh, Chet 
reached over and got his guitar and had it to Ron. And Ron sat there and played a tune. I don't recall the name of what the tune was now. Just everything was buzzing around for me. I didn't, you know. And I was talking to that woman there, and she said, that I've traveled with Chet for a long time, and that's the first time I've ever seen him let anybody touch his guitar. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was impressed with Ron's playing. You know, he played like Chet. And uh, back then, when, when Ron was young, uh, he was a direct copy of Chet's older, older type of music, you know, his old, early stuff, you know. And uh, while I was talking to Chet there in uh, Opera Land, which is around 72, 72 somewhere in the early 70s or mid, and I mentioned that to him, and he remembered Ron, but he had uh, seen him a time or two since that time of wisdom. Mm -hmm. But uh, I grew up with Ron. He was around here. He was one of the finest guitar players we had around here anywhere. And he, uh, he had real big hands, and he had to get a guitar that had a wider neck. Gene Foster bought this guitar in 1958 and it's custom built. You had to send the money to them and they built it and they sent it to you. And this is the way he ordered it like this. But he had his name on the neck here, Gene Foster. And uh, one time I had Ron Hensley work on the guitar. Uh, he done some work on the pickup. And uh, he took that name off. I don't know how he done it, but anyway, he, he, he took it off. And uh, Gene wouldn't keep a guitar long, you know. He sold it to my brother. And uh, my brother sold it to Dieter Peterson. And uh, Dieter was, had a run in a business down there building supplies. And, and he's going out of business and and uh, I went down there on a Saturday morning and he was selling everything, just whatever he could get out of it. And I bought a lawnmower from him and uh, I knew he had this guitar and I mentioned it to him and if I ain't badly mistaken, he asked me if, uh, if it was a 150 or 200, somewhere around there, and uh, I told him, I said, I've got a hundred dollars in my pocket and that's all I've got. And I always said, I can't stand it. I said, that, well, that's, that's it, Dieter. I, I don't have anything. That's all i got. And uh, I don't like going to debt. And I, I started leaving. He said, come here. So I went back and he, he got the guitar. And, uh, and the case that I've got with it was, the case that Red had, he had bought that first L5, and it, uh, it's all pieces. I mean, it was scratched up, the case was. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Peter put put it in that case and, and gave it to me, and I gave him $100 for it. And, uh, and I've had it ever since. And uh, that was... Uh, in 61, my brother kept it uh, seven or eight months, you know, and, and he didn't uh, he didn't play it much or anything like that. He didn't he played flat top all the time. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, he had sold it to Jeter, and then I, I bought it from Jeter, and. Uh, 
had it ever since. Uh, uh, I'll keep it. I'll keep it. Well, this keepsake. Yeah, it's a. Uh, it's connected to all the all the Irwin boys back then, you know. Yeah. All the Irwin pickers. Yeah, they all knew about this guitar. Yeah, you know, it's you know, and uh, uh, connected to the Irwin boys. The last that w we went to uh, Weaverville, North Carolina. Ron was at that time was getting pretty sick, pretty feeble, and uh, he uh, he didn't bring his guitar, and I had I took this one along, and uh, he Doc had fifty guitars or more, and, and you know he was he was a collector, and. Uh, had him sitting around and, and uh, Ron said, I didn't bring my guitar. He said, can I use, can play yours? And I said, well, sure, play it. And uh, we sat there over there for a couple hours playing the guitar and Ron played this one. And, and uh, that was the last time that Ron played any music. He, uh, he had a stroke stroke right after that. I went down, they took him down to Knoxville and I went down to see him and and uh, they, that was on a Wednesday and they said, he's fine, he's gonna, gonna make it over. all right, you know, and I talked to him. And there was a little old joke that he always told about when we was not making music and everything, he said that uh, Henry and his wife is in the iron and steel business. And she irons and he steals. <laughs> 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 anyway, uh, I went down there to see him and he was there in the bed and had everything all hooked up to him and everything. And, and uh, his daughter was sitting there and, and he told his daughter about that, you know. She got a big kick out of it. Said uh, he's going to be okay. and. Uh, He'd be home in a couple of weeks. Well, anyway, they they moved him out in the room the next day on Thursday, and uh, he got okay, everything fine. He was getting ready to come home. And they went in to check on him on Friday morning early, and he was gone. He died. So, uh, but him, me, and him run around together for every week, you know school together, yeah. first grade up, and he was a, Ron was a genius, he would be in there ever seen.